Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today I've got a very special guest for you. It's one of my uh, investing heroes and one of the best videos I ever watched about gold uh, way back in 2011 or 12. And I'm going to share the link to that video below. But uh, we welcome uh, Grant Williams. Thanks for coming on, Grant. Oh, mate, thanks for having me. For those that don't know, Grant is one of the partners of Real Vision and plenty of you enjoyed that interview we did with Raul. You've got a website, uh, things that make you go, hmm, and there's plenty of those things uh, in the financial markets these days. But for those that haven't followed your work, Grant, how did you get into markets and how did you start Real Vision and all that? Oh, um, look, I've been in markets since the mid-1980s, uh, as as the color of my hair now will... will um Aptly demonstrate. Uh, I, I started work in London for a, for a merchant bank called Robert Fleming and Co., which has long since been gobbled up by um, by J.P. Morgan. Um, and I started in the Japanese markets in the middle of you know what was a crazy, crazy bull market. And um, you know, I, I was I was fortunate to see what a bubble looked like up close. And, and I think to this day, I was very fortunate that a couple of years after starting in the markets, I saw the '87 crash. So you know, I, I have a a first-hand understanding of of what real pain looks like, and and just how badly markets can catch people off guard, and that's kind of you know I think that has that has been um, something that's coloured my understanding of excesses and bubbles. I, mean, I was in I was in New York when the Nasdaq bubble burst. Um, I was in down there in Sydney uh, in two thousand eight. So I've seen these things happen, and I you know it, it gives you a real sense of of how bad things can get in the midst of you know, a thirty-year run, which has taken every asset class on the planet just about to to astonishing highs. There's always that understanding that you know this could end tomorrow, and when it does, it could be uh, it could be pretty dramatic. Yeah. In terms of real vision, you know, Raul and I, um, he, he's another grey-haired, no, less grey hair than me, but he's another grey-haired sort of veteran of the markets, and we've both been kind of circling each other for a long, long time. Uh, read each other's stuff, fans of each other's work. We hadn't actually physically met. Um, which was amazing, frankly, given the number of mutual friends we had. But um, we finally put that right in Spain back in 2013. And, and it was literally over that first dinner that we had um, that we came up with the idea for Real Vision. And, and that was you know, six years ago now. And it's, uh, it's, it's been quite the right. It's amazing how time flies. I, I want to touch on a few great points you've made on already. So one of the best things I learned in the markets was getting into gold and silver heavily at a time when it started to maybe crash and then watching the crypto markets go up and down. It really fast tracks your learning of human psychology and a lot of stock market investors maybe go 20 or 30 years without really seeing that pain. So what was it like in Japan? What are the similarities to what we're seeing now? What happened there? And you know, we hear everyone saying that possibly central banks are turning Japanese now. Well, you know, the interesting thing, I, I was a young man back then, you know, I was in my early 20s. And so, you know, you, you, you're a lot more bulletproof, you haven't, you haven't had any bad experiences in markets. And, and whilst even, even then, I recognized that um, what was going on in Japan, it just didn't feel right. Um, it, it felt unsustainable. But you, you, at the same time, you never really thought that it would end. It was a, it was a really strange time. Um, and there were no shortage of articles explaining just how overvalued the real estate market was there, how crazy the stock market bubble was. But on a day-to-day -day basis, up close, when things just go up every day, you get inured to it, and and you you do have this this feeling that um, you know that that's a problem for another day, and it's actually not gonna mm. not gonna end up mattering. And I think it's only when you and, and don't forget the Japanese market, it never crashed. It it stopped going up and it started going down. Um, which is which is really interesting. You know, it was it was December thirty first, uh, nineteen eighty nine, when the market peaked, and on January the first, uh, you know, the next decade, it just started going down, and it did that for you know best part of twenty years. Yeah. So um, that was a wholly different experience to to eighty seven. Um, you know, I'd, I'd seen that up close, and that was a, a true shock to the system. In watching twenty two percent of the of the market get wiped out in a single day was, I mean, nothing prepared you for that. Um, so I think, you know, to your point about the cryptos, uh, unless you actually had a position in Bitcoin or one of the other altcoins during that madness, it's really something you read about in the newspapers. It's really something you read about you know, all these crazy guys making millions from nothing. And then you read the stories about these people who've lost everything. Mm. It's only when you really have skin in the game that you understand um, what these things actually mean. And so, so I think um, anyone that did experience the crypto uh, boom and, and temporary bust, um, and I'll choose my words carefully, 
uh, back in December of 2020 a real sense of what can happen. And I'm sure that will help them with risk management going forward. But if you if you got into crypto you know, late and you haven't really experienced that yet, fortunately, I guess there's there's never been a long period without any volatility in crypto. So everyone who's got uh, is in is in the space has, has a sense for that. But uh, I really think you have to experience this stuff uh, for it to really mean anything to you. Yeah, and no matter how old you are, it's it's a fast track learning experience. If you plan on trading markets for the next ten or twenty years, and even if you're sixty and passing wealth down onto your kids and grandkids by the time you're eighty, all these lessons can make you a better investor over time. So, what would be maybe the biggest lessons you learned from that uh, Japan style crash, and then the dot com bubble, and, and the other future crashes? You know. Um... I think there are, there are there are a thousand micro lessons that you learn on a day to day basis, and many of them about yourself and how you handle um, unexpected uh, events, unexpected consequences, how you handle yourself emotionally and professionally, which I think is um, is hard to do in the moment. And and I think you you get the experience where you look back and you think, "Geez, I wish I hadn't acted like that." I mean, that's that's an important thing for everybody to to try and be dispassionate about. But for me, it really was the importance of history. I mean, all the big events that I've kind of witnessed, um, the more I've read history, the more I've understood them, the more I've understood that they're absolutely, they're never unique. Mm. These things, these things happen throughout history. And, and I think if you, if you take the time to really uh, read about financial history and understand previous bubbles, previous manias, what caused them, um, what triggered their demise, you, you'll start to see patterns emerging, and look, it's 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 us, right? We are markets. It's it's a, it's markets are nothing more than the collective representation of the of the emotions of everybody participating. That's it. So of course they come down to human beings and, and our wildly fluctuating emotions. Um, so I think it, you really have to understand that. And and for me, history has been by far the best guide to to really getting a handle on that. Yeah, one of the slides you had in that presentation was talking about if you had have just made one trade every decade, and everyone in crypto is obsessed with this leverage and fast-paced world, but if you had have made one trade every decade and just got out of stocks at the right time and rotate into gold and whatnot, the returns you could have compounded are absolutely phenomenal. So how does gold fit into that now? Um, it's coming back into favor recently, but do you think with everything that's going on with low asset rates and money creation that there's just been no reason for someone to own this zero yield asset, but that is all going to come back to haunt people full circle when things get fairly priced again? Sure. I mean, look, that, that chart you, that you talked about is the perfect example because it began, I mean, the chart, what the chart showed you was, uh, I forget the exact numbers now, but if you invested $100 into gold at the beginning of the 1970s, and you held it onto it for the decade. And at the beginning of the 1980s, you sold your gold and bought Japanese equities. You held them for a decade. At the beginning of the 90s, you sold Japanese equities, bought uh, NASDAQ stocks, hold them for 10 years. And then again, you buy gold. Uh, and through to 2010, the returns were, you know, say 250,000 to one or something ridiculous. I forget the exact numbers. It's, it's in the presentation there. If yeah. you put a link to it, people will see it. But, um, but I think the beauty of that is the cyclicality it shows you. You began with gold, you ended with gold. Uh, and what that tells you is there's a time and a place for certain assets in a portfolio. Mm. Um, you know, for me, uh, I, I talk about gold a lot, and I think um, right now there's a time and a very big place in, uh, for gold in a portfolio. Mm. And that's not to say everyone should have 100% of their assets in gold. It's crazy to think that. But, mm. but anyone who doesn't have 5% for example, in gold as a starting point, hasn't read financial history and doesn't understand what happens in, in periods of excess. And I actually put a presentation together recently which which uh, contrasted um, you know, now uh, with the Roaring Twenties. And the similarities are extraordinary in terms of you know, blow off of debt, the inequality gap widening, et cetera, et cetera, crazy markets. Yeah. And obviously what followed that was the Great Depression. Um, and again, when you talk about the stuff, people say, oh, you're a doom monger, you're talking there's going to be another Great Depression. That's really not the point. The point is, if you look through history, you'll see similar times. And if you look back at those times, what performed really well, despite the price being fixed at the time in the next 10 years, was gold. Mm. Um, and so, you know, for me, gold is uh, the only pure financial asset. It is, uh, if you look back through history, it's the only asset that's that stood the test of time 
And don't get me wrong, there will be times when you don't want to own any gold in your portfolio or, or, or a minimal allocation all the time. People get fixated upon the price of gold and, and you know, I'm going to buy it here and maybe I'm going to sell it at 2000 If If you own gold for the right reasons, the price, I mean, genuinely, it's immaterial because mm -hmm. you're owning it for an event. You're owning it as protection. You're owning it as insurance. And when that hurricane blows through, your insurance policy will pay off and, and the price of gold may not even move. The price of gold may stay the same, but if the cost of everything else in the world that's overvalued gets flattened, your purchasing power increases by multiples. And that's the thing to understand. And that's the thing I try to get through to people is that, you know, stop fixating on the price, own it for a reason, own it for a set of circumstances that which if they come to pass, yeah. 6,000 years of history suggests it, it will be a guaranteed payout for you. Yeah, and I had another one of those aha moments, even though I've been you know, studying this for 10 years. The other day, we were talking to one of the bullion dealers, and he was saying that there's so many baby boomers these days that have accumulated a lot of wealth, and they're rotating into gold, not because they think it's a great thing for their portfolio and it's going to go up, simply because they think that stocks could go down in value, property could go down, and they don't really care if gold maybe goes back down 10 or 20%. It's just holding all that wealth that they've accumulated to pass on to their younger ones. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's it's if you look around um, the financial world in the last few months, you've seen uh, Paul Tudor Jones say that gold is his favourite investment for the next twelve to twenty-four months. You've seen Ray Dalio uh, say that anyone who doesn't have at least ten percent gold in their portfolio doesn't understand history, which you know, obviously I, I agree with. And then perhaps most tellingly, you had Stan Druckenmiller say that gold is his biggest currency position. Mm. And I think that's a really important distinction to make. You know, thinking of gold as a currency yeah. does change the way you look at it. And and I think, you know, those baby boomers, obviously, like me, have a lot of gray hair. I'm not quite a baby boomer, thankfully. Um, but they do have a lot of gray hair. They do have an understanding of more distant history than perhaps the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, which many people in the financial markets have. And they did see the inflation of the 70s. They, they have seen things that... Um, that the younger generations haven't. And, and you, you, look, you can read about uh, a lot of these things in history all you like and having an understanding of it. But again, going back to our first point, it's not until you live through these things and experience them that you really understand and have a, and have a, a tangible memory almost of, of what happened, what it means, and what you frankly wish you'd have done to mitigate the circumstances. And if it happens again, you know what you'll do. Yeah, you raise a good point about gold being a currency. And there's some good graphics that have been floating around a moment about about how big the you know US dollar is and then the Japanese, um, sorry, yen, yeah, then Chinese yuan and down that list. And there's a lot of sort of Southeast Asian currencies and a lot of, that have far higher market caps than gold or Bitcoin. And we're getting into this debate now about what central banks are going to do. Um, you know, the US with the unfunded liabilities at a time when a lot of other. Uh, are we right to go there, Grant? Are we cutting out, or is that okay? Uh, yeah, I lost you. you. You just just as you went through that list of currencies, you said there's a lot of Southeast Asian currencies, and then I lost you. Cool. Sorry, we're back, guys. Um, yeah, there's a lot of currencies that don't really have you know their own central bank and their own strength or assets to fall back on the us dollar is getting stronger and stronger i know you guys have done some work on the us dollar milkshake theory theory maybe you'll break that down for people but do you just see that these fiat currencies are just inflating away or having their own issues and people are saying you know even mark carney now saying well hold on why should the us dollar have these rights and at the time we've just got this little gold seven trillion market cap compared to all these fiat currencies with huge paper valuations yeah look it's it, it, you make a great point and if you look through those currencies you'll find for the most part with a few exceptions the most notable of which being the us dollar that the gold prices are all-time highs in all those currencies um, you know, if you'd had gold uh, in Indonesia or India or even Australia, a yeah. uh, perfect example, Canada, uh, Europe, Japan, all these places, if you'd owned gold over the last 10 years, it's at all time highs now. Um, you know, that means you know, the prices have never been higher in you know, thousands of years of recorded history. And yet people look at the US dollar and, and the price there, which is you know, dropped back below 1500 again. Um, and they feel that that is the only true barometer. I mean, try telling that to someone in Bangladesh or, or uh, you know, or India. But um, you know, with re respect, fiat currencies. In, in this most recent presentation I was talking about, I, I had a, a slide go up that had 594 currencies just scrolling through the screen while I was talking about something. 
uh, all of which have vanished for one reason or another uh, over the years. And that, I mean, that's that's uh, which have uh, which have gone away over the years. Um, fiat currencies, um, and it's it's the only it's only the, the existing uh, cohort that remain. And at some point. Uh, they will, if history is any guide, they will go away. But it's very difficult to see that in the moment. It's very hard to understand um, what these things look like. And, and the reimposition of some kind of a gold standard uh, is something that people just can't get their heads around. They'll dismiss it out of hand. And, and the presentation I put together last year addressed this. It was like, look, you, you have to understand that in the last 200 years, we've been on a gold standard far longer than when we've, we've been off on. We just happen to have lived through 40-year period of no gold standard and to hear guys like mark carney talk about the dollar supremacy being under question and to look at the moves being made by the chinese the russians the turks the saudis the iranians to um, exchange their own currencies uh, for gold and oil there is a framework being put in place here whether people like it or not whether they want to acknowledge it or not it's besides the point but if you look closely it's happening the the dollar is being chipped away at um, in its foundations uh, and you know, someone like Carney coming out and saying that is 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 a very very important thing for people to understand. We can't imagine a world without the U.S. dollar being, uh, you know, the hegemon currency. Um, but 500 years ago, people couldn't imagine the world without the Portuguese escudo. If you can remember that, being the most important currency in the world. But of course, that went. The Spanish peseta went. Um, the Dutch guilder went. The British pound went. They've all succumbed to inevitable. Uh, decline uh, because once a, a country has a reserve currency, they do what the Romans did, they do what the Brits did, they do what the Spanish did, they're doing what the Americans are doing, and that's build a great big empire, mm. which is extremely expensive to maintain. And the, and the bigger it gets, the further the reaches are, the harder that is to do. And ultimately, that gets reflected in the currency. Again, you know, history, it's all there, it's all in the history books. So yeah. um, I, I think what you're talking about is absolutely happening. Yeah. So you definitely think that we could go to, you know, a five or ten thousand dollar gold price US sounds sounds crazy, but then you just look back and say, well, you know, gold in Australia was two hundred dollars an ounce not that long ago, and here we are at two thousand dollars an ounce, a tenfold increase, and the sky's not falling. People go to work every day, and that's just the price of gold. Do you think that could just as easily happen in the US over the next ten years? Well, again, I I, I try so hard to shy away from talking about the price of gold because it's mm. just not that important to me but mm -hmm. but the the point of my presentation last year which was which was called cry wolf and and uh, if you if you'd search for it, people be able to see it. it's up on the internet somewhere i'm sure um i, I talked about and it, it really was a, a thought exercise it, let's let's talk about what a gold standard is how it might get reintroduced and, and why and what might happen um and it's interesting you know a lot of people uh, as soon as you start talking about it, they go oh god this, it'll never happen it's a waste of time Mm. Um, but when you, the point I was making in the presentation was, look, you when you talk about, oh, they, they'll never put a gold standard back in place, it, it's very much seen as something that would be a decision that was made, right, let's go back to the gold standard. And again, you look back through history, it's never a decision that's made. It's it's the solution to a set of problems that occur. It, mm. It's a solution to over-indebtedness. Over it's a solution to collapsing monetary systems. Gold provides an anchor, and it's it's a safe harbor to go back to in a storm. And when you look at what's happening right now, um, there are storms blowing all around the world, whether it's in the debt markets, whether it's in uh, the global economies, whether it's on a social um, level or a political level, there are storms blowing everywhere. And again, mm. these are the same storms we've seen, um, and I hate to say it, but the same storms we've seen in the 1930s. And we all know what what that led to, and what it began. You know, it began with the Great Depression and ended with the Second World War. Yeah. Um, so, if a gold standard comes back, the, the price of gold will be materially higher. Mm. Who knows uh, what the price will be? But it will it will have to be material higher to cover the outstanding um, debt in the world. There could be restrictions on gold movement, as there were in nineteen in the thirties when the FDR um, confiscated private ownership of gold yeah that'd be a lot harder to do now simply because the ownership of gold is far wider spread mm. um but but these are important things to just think about i mean yeah. I, you know, I as i say about gold all the time think about it if you think it through read some history and work out why you should own gold and you think you don't need to that's that's fine it's yeah. perfectly fine but just understand what's gone before understand its place in the monetary system, in the financial system, and then decide for yourself whether it, it, it fits your portfolio. So I want to run you through 
my base case of how I've sort of changed from someone that used to think that markets would crash many years ago when you first go down the rabbit hole and everyone's telling you the world's going to end. I really think now that central banks are going to do everything they can to keep asset prices afloat and we're going to turn Japanese where they're just going to buy ETFs and stocks and there's going to be no free markets anymore. We could argue we're already there in the in the bond market with, with negative yields and whatnot. But the way that I think this ends is in inequality and social unrest, people wearing yellow vests and taking to the streets and whatnot. And do you think that is maybe the thing that central banks, governments and planners didn't see coming? They thought they could continue to get away with this? Look, there, there are always unintended consequences. Um, and I think you're right. And look, there's a, there's a perfect case in point in Australia right now, right? I mean, the RBA have cut rates again this week um, to 75 basis points, which would have been unthinkable in Australia a few years ago. When I moved there in uh, 05, rates were 7.5%, I think, I seem to remember. Um, you know, this would have been unthinkable. Uh, they are, in the in the RBA minutes, you, you can see that they're concerned about the housing market they're worried about adding more fuel to the fire in the housing market but guess what they're going to do it anyway because mm. they are worried they are worried about the fragility of the economy they are worried about unemployment they are worried about the lack of inflation which is i mean it's a topic for another day but mm. this idea that if we can't create inflation it's a disaster it's just it's yeah. just fallacious at best yes and ludicrous at worst but but the RBA are telling you, look, we have to keep this thing together. And unless we can lower rates and stimulate borrowing and get people going out and, and taking out more credit, mm. this whole thing is going to collapse. And the housing market, they can have all the Royal Commissions they want. They can do all the talking about um, you know, inflated house prices and how dangerous it is. But that's the lesser of the two evils by far. Mm. Unfortunately, um, Australia is the perfect case in point. If a recession comes, or when a recession comes, which it will, I mean, I, it, it, to me, it's yeah, it's it's far more imminent perhaps than people realise. It's not going to matter what they do with rates. The housing market won't be saved by low rates in a recession when people are losing their jobs. It just won't. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think what you talk about is absolutely right. They are going to go down the Japanese path because, a, it optically it looks like Japan hasn't really suffered any negative outcomes from it, although. I lived in Japan for four years way back and Japanese society is wholly different to that in the US, Europe, the West. It just it's just it just doesn't work the same way. And I suspect those differences will be deleterious to this hmm. idea of turning Japanese in, in Western economies. Hmm. Um, but they will go down that road. There's there's no two ways about it. But you know, and what you talk about, people wearing yellow vests, it's happening. So if if, if this inequality divide is where we end up, well as Churchill said, this may not be uh, the beginning of the end, but it's the end of the beginning, and, and we're moving into that phase now because protests are starting up all around the world, and they are driven by inequality. There's there's no two ways about it. Yeah, not only that, we've seen some a great presentation that went viral recently talking about how during the Asian financial crisis, central banks got together and told them, you know, whatever you do, don't don't print money and whatnot. And then when the West got in the crisis, they've started printing money. So I think we're seeing more. Um, friction between governments and central banks around the world. We, we spoke about Mark Carney before, but China and Russia and hoarding of these assets and who's got the resources. Once we all people have their heads around these concepts of fiat currencies, if I'm just pressing that print button to buy up all your oil or your gas or your gold, I think it's really coming back to, well, who's actually got what and who's backed by anything in this world where we're just all gonna print fiat and buy our assets off one another? Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, you're absolutely right. I think this uh, you've hit upon something really important there, and that is the fact that central banks are starting to reach this every man for himself uh, phase, which turns into a more of a currency war, which is where we are. Let's face it, you know, what, what Draghi did uh, a couple of weeks ago in restarting QE um, and uh, you know the, this, this whatever-it-takes mentality um, has put Powell in the firing line with Trump um, and the Fed subsequently, you know, have, have come out with all kinds of dovish talk to try and manage expectations. The RBA have joined suit. Uh, there's plenty of articles in, in the financial press the last couple of weeks talking about uh, Corona Sam, BOJ, is going to have to come out with extreme measures. Now, I mean, you know, imagine what extreme <laughs> measures must look like in Japan. It's yeah. hard yeah. to comprehend, but, but that's where we are. And this unified front that central banks have had for a decade now is starting to splinter, just as some of the societies that they they oversee are starting to splinter. You know, the, the, the sad thing for me is that for most people, the connection between monetary policy 
and these social outcomes isn't apparent. People no. don't understand the direct link, and it's a very, very direct link um, between the two. Um, I think if people, there'd be a lot more um, outrage and a lot more opposition to some of the things that central banks have been doing, yeah. which would ultimately lead to you know a, a clearing event. Now, look, make no mistake, what they're trying to do is prevent um, a really bad time for, for a lot of people. Um, but going back to what we started with, the cyclicality of, of humans and, and our natures, it will happen. You know, this, this clearing event will happen. The longer we leave it, um, the worse it's going to be. And so you can argue that, well, if we can delay it as long as possible, then we should do that. And I understand the argument for that. But I also think that what you're doing is storing up problems um, from those baby boomers who are now swapping all their financial assets for gold mm. to uh, you know, Gen Xs and Millennials and Gen Y and Gen Z. And, and one of them is going to end up holding the, holding the can and the can is getting bigger by the day. And, and at some point, um, it's, it's really not going to be a good scene. Yeah, and I know, as you said, it all comes back to financial education. And I think if more people understood what was going on, we'd have more Occupy Wall Streets in yellow vests. But one of the things we've seen since we had all this money creation was record buybacks, you know, dividends instead of investing in the future. And these execs that are getting bonuses, and we read the other day, it's up to 500 to one, the CEO salaries of the average worker now in some Australian companies. Is that where the breaking point once people are just educated about all this? And is that why we're seeing inequality with the wealthy moving away and bunkering down and just they're going to leave everyone to, you know, wherever does the dust settle? Well, I mean, Charlie Munger famously said, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcomes. So I think what's what's happening uh, at the, at the C-suite level with buybacks and juicing stock prices makes perfect sense because they're all rewarded for the performance of their stock. So that, that makes, that, that's no surprise whatsoever. I think the old sore about the difference between uh, a recession and depression is, is actually important to understand. You know, the, the, the joke goes that the difference between a recession and a depression, it's a recession when your neighbor loses his job, it's a depression when you lose yours. And I think that's the problem here. If, if, if enough people start to lose their jobs, they will very quickly begin to understand what's happening and why as long as they uh, they've got a job and they've got access to to cheap credit and they can run up their credit cards and, and get seven year loans to buy a car um and you know monthly payments they can quote unquote afford um then everything kind of seems okay and and i think for most people they don't really spend any time thinking about the world around them and, and look in many cases there's no reason they should um, if everything's okay, then then why sit there and worry about it? I think we in the financial industry, because we're at the, the epicenter of it all and we, we kind of have to understand what's happening, you realize that, that not only is money the root of all evil, it's the root of all society. And if, if, if you are in that world, you can't help but understand um, uh, and, and, and seek a greater understanding of what it all means. And, and at the end of the day, the place we are in that cycle is is you know, a Kondratiev winter, which is um, uh, you know these are forty year cycles um, that a Russian economist put together years ago, and we are heading into the worst part of those four seasons, and mm. and it, it it behooves people to 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 batten down the hatches, and at the very least, as I keep saying, at the very least, sit down and think about what. A stock market crash would mean to you how would it change your life how would it impact your life and if you're sitting on gains that you've made over the last 10 years think about even if it's just putting them in cash you don't have to buy gold gold's not the only safe asset right but, but mm. take them out of risky assets and put some of them somewhere so you have a fund should uh, history repeat itself which it always does are you guys seeing more younger people interested in finance these days? And as you said, that whether it's Kondratiev waves or there's old sayings that you know change takes two generations, and we've seen. The, I speak to my grandparents, and they would have never dreamt about taking out huge loans to build right. a house, buy a car, um, go to college, to buy a TV and a fridge. You need a loan these days, and I think that I'll be teaching that sort of message, and a lot of other millennials will, to their their children about saving and not going into debt and being a debt slave your whole life. Do you think that that's all sort of part of society that's changing? It's interesting. You know, the um, in in Germany, we had the Weimar hyperinflation in the 1920s. And, and to all intents and purposes, the last living survivors of that era 
uh, have died over the last number of years. Um, you know, the, the number of people who remember lived through the Great Depression, uh, again, is who are old enough to remember, they'd be in their late 80s now. So, so these memories do fade. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's funny, it's a simple thing. But when you say, I talk to my grandparents about this stuff, how many people sit and talk to their grandparents about how they bought their first refrigerator, right? No, mm. no one does. But in there, there are just some fascinating, fascinating lessons. I mean, with regards to younger people, I think, um, you know, the, the, the advent of, of crypto has been fantastic for engaging um, a younger generation with, with finance and money. I think it serves a great, uh, does a great service doing that. It does a disservice in that um, a lot of the people that come in um, it, it, the crypto space leads them to poo-poo existing money. Oh, yeah, that's dead. Forget it. I don't need to learn about that. I'm just going to learn about this new wave of, mm. of finance. Mm. Um, so it is a double-edged sword, but I think the, the more young people get educated about money, what, what money truly is, the more they understand finance and economics, the better for everybody. I mean, you know, down to teaching kids to balance checkbooks and, and showing them a set of compounding interest tables. I mean, the compound interest tables were, were always known as the ninth wonder of the world. And if you, if you look at them, understand how they work, it really does change your, your perspective on, on money. But it's, it's something that doesn't get taught these days. So you know, Real Vision, we've, we've tried to embrace that younger generation. We've tried to offer as much of a financial education as we can for people. Hmm. And I think it's incredibly important that everybody takes that upon themselves. I mean, it's, you know, it's, no one's going to do it for you. You have to be curious. You have to want to learn. But I think yeah. to your earlier point, once you go down these rabbit holes, there's no going back because it's 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 not only fascinating, but but money is the story of mankind. I mean, there's no there's no greater story ever written. Yeah, it's funny watching the run up recently as someone that's been talking about gold for years, and people only start to listen once it goes, par yeah. you know, parabolic to fifteen hundred. And I'm sure there's people watching this that bought the top, and now they're learning their lesson, and that's fine. You know, you've got to go through these these cycles. But everyone in the YouTube community jumped on the gold and silver bandwagon right at the top of that market. So, yeah. Grant, anything else that you feel is super important that we haven't discussed today? Where this is all going? Oh, mate, <laughs> you and I could sit here and talk all day about the things that are going on in the world. I mean, yeah. it, you've got you've got the, the, the complex stuff like the repo market, um, the, the euro dollar markets. There's all kinds of financial plumbing stuff, which to seasoned financial professionals are red flags being raised. And, and they and they and they do give you um, pause for thought and, and, and make you want to consider what these could be signaling. But away from that, you know, just looking at um, for me, things like WeWork, for example, you know, WeWork is um, has become a front page story. It's it's being in Vanity and New York Magazine, and so a lot of mainstream media are talking about this company, and it's become something of a sideshow. But there's an incredibly important lesson in here. You know, this 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 thing was a was a sixty ninety billion dollar company according to Goldman Sachs just a few weeks ago. In the space of three weeks, it's gone from um, you know, potentially being a let's, let's split the difference, seventy-five billion dollar company, to essentially being worth zero, mm. um, and the implications of that are tremendous. Not just in terms of these so-called unicorn companies, which which in the private markets get spiralled up to enormous valuations before getting dumped on the public, <laughs> um, but in things like the New York real estate market. You know, uh, WeWork's footprint is the biggest landlord um, in. Um, uh, New York City now they've overtaken JP Morgan. The, the, the amount of space they have is uh, up 73% year on year. They were 6% of the New York real estate rental market. I mean, these are big numbers. And to have a company like WeWork, first, um, essentially nothing changed except the narrative. Yeah. The company didn't change. All the things it had been talking about were crystallized in the, in the S1 filing it made before it IPO. Mm. People read it and they could no longer ignore the nonsense in there. And so all that happened was the narrative changed. Yeah, uh, they went from a, a you know a sixty billion dollar IPO to a forty billion dollar to a twenty to a ten, trying to find a level where people might invest. Nothing happened. People just decided, you know what, I, I can't invest in this here. Yeah, uh, and the chain event, the chain of events that that could trigger, are are epic. I mean, truly epic. 
we were talking about these and I know it's very different to the ICO market, but there are parallels. So there was companies out there that had, you know, a flashy white paper worth forty million. Now, you know, the Ubers and Beyond Meats and whatnot, sure they've got revenue and whatnot, but again it's all flashy dressing that makes them worth forty billion and then all of a sudden that becomes worth a lot less overnight, as you say, when only the well, narrative changes. Well look, it's it's not even flashy dressing, right? What happens with these things is they, they stay private and a bunch of Silicon Valley VCs have round after round watching themselves arbitrarily. And then when they get to a nice juicy valuation, they IPO and the public pays $60 billion where they cash out all the private equity guys. And for the most part, you know, all these things, look at Uber, look at Peloton, look at all these high profile IPOs. They all trade down and the public gets left holding the bag. That's, that's the nature of these things. Unfortunately, the sophisticated investors are called that for a reason. And the public are the unsophisticated investors mm. this time. Um, they didn't get it away, and it looks like the sophisticated investors are going to be left holding the bag, mm. and that will have implications. There's, there's no way this doesn't ripple through the, the, the private markets, the, the real estate market in New York, the real estate market globally. Um, it's, it's a big deal, and, and the good news about this is that people with only a casual interest in finance can read about this because it's in mainstream media, not just financial publications, and so. Uh, reading a story like that with with a villain and you know colorful characters and a narrative is important to understanding just how these things uh, are built up and how they can come down. Final question, Grant. I, our audience would uh, have my neck if I didn't ask you about crypto. So I know before you discussed you know gold being maybe say ten percent or protection insurance, it's not a hundred percent in your portfolio. A lot of people now are talking about that Bitcoin narrative, whether it's one percent or five percent, it's uncorrelated. It's a new asset class. Do you think this performs really badly in a stock market crash or unwind, or do you think that this can still perform well depending on what's going on with the currency wars and if markets are still going down? Yeah, I think it's a really important question, and it's one we just won't know, right? I know how gold performs in stock market crashes. I know how it performs in inflation, hyperinflation, deflation. We've seen it all. We haven't seen it with crypto. And I mean, mean, who knows? It could go either way. It could become... A, a, a store of value for a lot of people that, that flood to Bitcoin, or it could be uh, that the bid just disappears completely. We, we won't know. I mean, we really won't know. Mm. I still think everybody should have a, a tiny piece of crypto in their in their portfolio, just because I, I don't think it's going away. Um, I was at dinner last night talking to two guys who who are in the crypto space, and, and as I said to them, I said, yeah, "Look, you know, I, I my knowledge of crypto is so far beneath the people that immerse themselves mm. in that space." You know, I, I just I don't think it's it's sensible for me to yeah. to, to offer advice because I, I don't. But but for me personally, I have a small allocation, and I think everybody should have money they can afford to lose in crypto, because I I, I just think this technology is not going away anytime soon. Yeah, and as someone that is more of a you know gold background, as you say, you don't probably understand crypto as much. Is the case of smartphone usage around the world in developing nations and someone being able to, at a push of a button, park their wealth in in Bitcoin that they know is going to hold its value better than their local currency that's inflating away, do you think that that's something that has a big advantage over gold? How does that average person with just a smartphone get their hands on some gold and store gold? Whereas I see gold at the top end of town, the big money wants protection. Yeah, but but again, don't forget, this is a cultural thing. we, we talk about where do people get hold of gold. Anybody in India, for example, yeah. knows how to get gold. They, their grandparents have been buying them grams of gold since they were born. Yeah. Uh, it's no mystery there. You know, to us in the West, it is. It's a big deal to go down um, you know, to, 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 uh, to a dealer in, in Sydney and, and find buy yourself some gold and figure out how to do it and fill forms in. And yeah. the, the rest of the world just doesn't function like that. So, okay. I, so I think that the younger generation of smartphones will absolutely gravitate towards that. But you have a tradition to break across um, Asia, the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa. There's a tradition that you need to break first of owning gold. And while uh, Bitcoin is certainly going to compete with that, I, I don't think it's going to be an instantaneous transition. And um, you know, in, 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 if in the first serious market meltdown we get, Bitcoin doesn't perform very well, it'll set that hmm. transition back maybe a generation. Yeah. Interesting. Well, guys, I will put the links to all Grant's presentations down below to where to follow him. But any final thoughts for people at home today, Grant? Oh, look, uh, as I said, I, 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 I preach this. I, I get a bit bored of listening to myself about it, to be honest. But, but I really think people 
need to pay attention right now. I think they need to go through the exercise of, of looking at your portfolio, stress test it, understand what a 10, 15, 20% drawdown would mean to you. Um, and if it would have a, a, an effect and change the way you live your life, then you really need to think about what you do with that. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be gold at all, but it could be finding, um, you know, putting it in cash. It could, it could be Bitcoin. It could be any kind of things. But to, but to just sit back and not take the time to assess the risk uh, is a really dangerous Fantastic. Well, it's cut out a little bit there at the end, Grant, but um, thanks so much for joining us today, mate, and I hope you guys have enjoyed that one. You're welcome. Thanks, Alex.